Well, measurements take a big part of a laboratory. Uh, it's a laboratory, right? So we're going to take lots of measurements. We're going to talk about those today and with this exercise, uh, a couple exercises actually, dealing with measurements. Measurements are very important in many situations. We use them casually all the time. Hey, by the way, what time is it? Well, I look at my watch and I say, oh, it's about 11.50. Did you hear that about? Th that was a measurement, right? According to this clock, it was about, but it was actually 11.49 and 19 seconds. So the, the resolution increases uh, as I talked about that measurement that way. There's other measurements that we take um, every day uh, with a ruler. So here's just a straight edge and there's a, there's a metric scale on here and it counts from one and this goes all the way up to about 45 centimeters. Okay, and then turn it over and it does inches. And there's all sorts of measurements that we take all the time. We don't want to take measurements for granted in the laboratory. We want to focus on them. We want to understand those measurements. So we're going to talk through what a measurement entails. We'll start here with this discussion of how well do we really know that measurement, okay? And what do we mean by that? So, for example, how long is the word no, all right? So if we can zoom in right now, we see that there's some problems. So I just want to look at the word no. And we see that, okay, if I want to measure the word no, my scale is sitting right here. And, well, the K, the left side of the K isn't lined up with any particular mark. And the right side of the W is even more troublesome because the top of the W is way far away from my scale. And so we run into problems. We call this parallax, okay, when we're trying to, to measure something and it's not touching our scale. But we'll talk about that again in a little bit. So how well do we really know that measurement? When it comes to taking a measurement, what is included in taking that measurement? The first item that we have is an object, or we need something that, w that needs to be measured, okay? So that object could be, oh, today we're actually gonna be measuring the length of this, of this rod. And there's some problems with measuring the length of the rod, and we'll talk about that. So this would be our object to measure. Uh, but I'm going to modify this first one right away just a little bit, and I'm going to put double quotes around, put quotation marks around object, all right? Because an object can sometimes be a little elusive. Like, let's say we want to measure the speed of light, okay? I can't really grab some light and then let it go, okay, with my hand. I can't really hold it or see it or feel it. Oh, wait, I guess I'm seeing light, okay? But there, there's an example of why we need to say object, all right? So, but we need something to measure. Secondly, what do you think it is? The second thing that we need in a measurement is a standard of measure, okay? Now, standards are, are not easy to come by. Uh, and in fact, they're very expensive to find and to keep up. By standard, we, well, we get a cheap one from the, um, from the drugstore down the street. Th this is a standard, okay? Somebody marked this up and they called it inches on this side and they call it centimeters on this side. And if we look at this a little bit closer, we can see that there's smaller marks. Are those in focus? Cool. So there's smaller marks for the centimeters and those little marks are millimeters. Now, if this is a good standard, there I'm attaching a, a word like good to this. If this is a good standard, it's been compared to a standard that's accepted around the world. Okay, so somewhere, hopefully somebody is holding a meter, okay, in their office. And anybody in the world can make an appointment and go in there and there's the meter standard. And they would take their rod and compare it to the meter and put a mark on their rod and say, that's one meter. Okay, and then they'd have to divide that up carefully to get equal divisions um, into centimeters and millimeters and whatever else they wanted to measure. So someone's holding that standard, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, uh, NIST, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, we're actually lucky to have them uh, based here in Colorado, just north of Denver and Boulder. Um, Fort Collins is also another place for NIST. 
Now the time server, I believe, is in Fort Collins. But in this, they actually hold the meter. Okay, and believe it or not, the meter is not held on a rod, kept at a certain temperature. Instead, it's pretty ingenious. Okay? Sometimes measurements are indirect or, or around the bend or something like that. Uh, measurements for the meter are kept in, at NIST as actually the distance traveled by light in a certain, uh, in a certain time frame. That's pretty cool, if you think about it. That's how they hold the meter as a standard. And anybody can make an appointment and probably pay some money, I don't know, I haven't done it myself, and find out what a meter looks like compared to their rod. And then they'll take their rod back to their manufacturing plant and they'll process a bunch of measurement devices, okay, based on that standard. So that's a lengthy discussion about a standard of measure. We want to be careful with those standards. NIST also holds the second. Okay, does anybody know how the second is held by NIST? I mean, is there some poor person sitting there going, okay, seven, eight, nine, ten. These, these are seconds, 11, 12, 13. Okay, uh, actually what they have at NIST is a cesium atom. I believe it's a cesium atom. And the cesium atom is wiggling, okay? And after so many wiggles of the cesium atom, one second has gone by. And the cesium atom is very stable and it's, and it's wiggling, so they know that number. And then there's some person sitting there watching it going, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. no, I'm kidding, because it's a whole lot of wiggles, okay? So the cesium atom is how they contain the second. And then they take that second and they send it to, I believe it's Fort Collins where the time server is and for the U.S. And, and a signal is sent out from there and we have all these atomic clocks. My watch has an atomic receiver on it and that just simply means that it's receiving the, the radio frequency from that atomic clock. Atomic because it's the cesium atom uh, up in Fort Collins. Okay, and so our clocks can set themselves every day and, and be um, accurate. Okay, and by accuracy in this sense, we mean matching a standard for time. Okay, the, which, which is important, especially for things like GPS. Um, GPS is standing here with a little device, and there's, there's at least three satellites around here, GPS satellites, that this device receives signals from. But the timing is critical. Okay? We have to know the time for each of these. And actually, if you look into this topic, you'll see that um, relativity gets involved. Okay, with GPS signals and finding out where we're sitting on planet Earth. Standards are used all the time, and it's important that we have agreement. Okay, and so I was talking about a clock, and if I want to have accuracy in what time it is, I need to compare my clock to the standard clock held by NIST. And then I can say that the time is accurate, 11.57 and 15 seconds. Okay, and then I'd say, well, it's plus or minus less than a second, okay? Because I know the, the precision of this measurement and its accuracy. The accuracy is checked every morning at three, four, and five in the morning. It talks to the NIST time server involving the, um, the accuracy. The precision is like this. Well, the time is 11.57. Hmm. That's accurate because it's been compared to the time server, but the precision is at the minute level. If I were to say, well, it's about 12 o'clock, well, now I'm at the hour level for my precision. Okay, a little bit different than accuracy, isn't it? If I said, well, it's 11.58 and two seconds, now I've just increased my precision. Right? I'm, I'm quoting more decimal places of the measurement. 
So we need some standard of measure. Next, we need a unit of measure, and we've been throwing those out in this discussion. Uh, the unit of measure on a, on a ruler could be millimeters or centimeters, or it could be inches, okay, or a sixteenth of an inch. So we need some unit of measure, uh, centimeters or meters or inches. We could use newtons or pounds. There's all sorts of units of measure. And NIST.org is a great place to go to learn about units. They have the base units listed and then all the derivative units that are based upon those base units. So again, in order to take a measurement, we need an object. We need a standard of measure. That standard is going to imply a unit of measure. I want you to think through all these things with every measurement that you take this semester. And then we need, this is one that people often forget, because it seems trivial, but frankly, it's not. It is called the measurement procedure. Okay, how we go about taking that measurement. That can impact greatly our final answer for the measurement. We'll talk more about measurement procedure. And then we have something that's called the uncertainty of the measurement. The uncertainty of the measurement is how well did we actually know the measurement. We can only give a best estimate for our measurement of the object based on the standard, which has a unit. Using our procedure for measurement, we'll find out that there's uncertainty in the measurement. And in fact, there's uncertainty in every single measurement that you take. We don't want to take that for granted. Measurements have a best estimate according to the scale and then we have to evaluate the uncertainty. Without the uncertainty, we're not fully reporting the measurement. Now, we've become lazy in America with our reporting of measurements, and, and it's just part of casual speech, so that's okay. I mean, think about how often you've done this. Well, how old are you? Oh, well, I'm, um, let's see, 42. Really? 42 what? Oh, the unit. Oh, you want the unit of measure. Well, it's 42 years. Oh, well, is there some more precision you could give? Okay, I, I, I would need to list 42 years, this many days, this many hours, this many minutes, this many sec. You get the idea? So the uncertainty involved can come from many different methods, and, and we'll check into that. So when I say, oh, how much do you weigh? Well, I weigh 200 pounds. Well, plus or minus two pounds because I've measured it over so many days and I seem to range between 198 and 202. And so now I've given a full measurement. I'm 200 pounds plus or minus two pounds. I think people would get rather tired of hearing that. You go into the DMV to get your license updated. How much do you weigh? Well, 185 plus or minus that. Okay, we're not expecting that. But in a laboratory, we are. In a laboratory, we're interested both in the measurement and the uncertainty. So I want you to be careful in thinking about the uncertainty during the semester. And finally, we have this concept called the confidence factor. Okay, the confidence factor is, it, well, frankly, it's the uncertainty in the uncertainty. That, that's our confidence. Do we have confidence in this measurement? Well, I got this many centimeters, 2.9 centimeters, plus or minus one centimeter, with a confidence of 68%. And there's a whole study based upon uncertainties and on confidence factors. So we're going to go through each of these with a few examples. Regarding measurements, we're going to focus quite a bit on three areas. There's a couple that I'm assuming, <laughs> assuming that you will care about all semester just by default. And those would be the standard that you're using and the unit. Okay, whenever you take a measurement, you'll know those instantly. Hopefully. We need to spend some time talking about measurement procedure. Because one, it can be tricky. And two, measurement procedure can actually deeply impact the uncertainty of the measurement and the confidence factors. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about measurement procedure and uncertainty of measurement. And finally, we're going to talk about an idea that is called error 
um, prop propagation, and I'm terrible at spelling, but I'm pretty sure there's an A right there, propagation. Uh, that's how errors or uncertainties propagate through an equation, okay? Because oftentimes, after we take a measurement, we'll take a different measurement and we'll manipulate those measurements somehow. Um, if they're the same unit, we might add them. Um, if they're different units, we might take their multiple or, or the ratio of the two. And so those uncertainties somehow have to translate through that formula, that equation, that manipulation of the measurements. So we'll spend quite a bit of time also talking about error propagation, but we'll start here with uncertainty in measurement. For uncertainty of measurement, I want you to ask with every measurement you take, and the lab manual does not focus on this. The lab manual is not going to ask you for the rest of the semester to stop and ask these three questions. Today, we're asking you, know these three questions and ask them all semester for every single measurement you take. I should say for every measurement type. If you're going to take a length measurement 20 times and it's a similar procedure for the measurement, then you're probably only going to ask these questions at the beginning of that. Okay, but if you're going to take length measurements that are intrinsically changing, then you might have to ask these three questions again during the experiment. Let's talk about these three questions. The first one, and remember, these are addressing the question of what is my uncertainty? I've taken my measurement, but how do I know the uncertainty? And pardon me. Number one is the resolution, or often called the readability of my measuring device. It's my standard with the unit. How readable is that device? How does it allow me to read? To what decimal place do I get in precision? Again, remember that accuracy is comparing it to some known standard. The second question that we ask with uncertainty is the interface or the interaction with the measurement. Let me give you two examples. You can keep the camera there. Here's a, a multimeter, a digital multimeter, DMM. And with this digital multimeter, I could hook these probes up to a different, say, a resistor. Okay, and then I could turn it on and, and there's a digital readout here and well, there's, there's my measurement, and there wasn't much involved. I just hooked it up and turned it on and read the measurement. The procedure or the interface, the interaction, is not very important in that case. In this case, with the digital measurement, we would be looking at the resolution, the readability. But here's another case. This is what we'd call an analog measurement. I want to measure the length of this rod. And so I'm going to take this rod, and now I actually have some measurement procedure that's involved. I have to decide where I'm going to start my measurement. As you'll hopefully learn, we never use the end of a measuring device. Unless we've paid money to the company that made this to make the end truly zero. So you'll see in our laboratory one, many of our meter sticks are sawed off at the end at a crooked fashion. Okay, just to mess up the end of the stick on purpose so that you never use it. But the procedure for this measurement is actually a little bit involved. So we have to start out non-zero. Well, now I'm going to use a metric side. And then we're going to have to figure out how we're going to get rid of a problem called parallax. The uncertainty or the readability of an analog measurement can be taken as plus or minus one, the smallest division. The reason that works is because normally with a ruler like this, it's a two-point measurement. One point here and one point here. And with each one, we can resolve with our eyeballs, we can resolve to one-half the smallest measurement. When this object is sitting in between two of the lines, we can say, well, it looks like it's halfway between. Or it's close enough that it's right on the line. In some disciplines, they actually have you take the smallest division and divide it up into 10 parts. And then they call that the best guess for the next decimal place. And in physics, what we do rather is do the measurement. And for an analog measurement, our rule is one half the smallest marking. 
And then for the best guess, we talk about that within our uncertainties. So we're both going to get to that best guess um, for the uncertainties. In this measurement, we have uncertainty at the beginning, which is one half a millimeter, because a millimeter is the smallest marking. And at the end of this rod, we have the same uncertainty, one half millimeter. And so the length of this rod will be so many millimeters, plus or minus one half millimeter. Because, I mean, excuse me, plus or minus a half, plus a half. Okay. So that readability, the resolution doesn't quite cut it for a length measurement. This works for that digital measurement, say measuring ohms, because that's what the ohm meter reported to us. That readability, we'll talk more about digital measurements. But for an analog measurement, the procedure, the interface of the interaction actually increases the uncertainty. Because we could have half millimeter uncertainty, but it's a two point measurement. So our procedure, our interface, our interaction was two places we measured, making the uncertainty plus or minus one millimeter. One half millimeter times two. And then finally, and this is the, this is the crown jewel, the repeatability. And sometimes this is not applicable, but when it is, we want to employ repeatability. One of these questions is going to answer for us, what is the uncertainty in my measurement? And there are actually some more questions we could ask, but we're going to focus on these um, during most of the experiments this semester. The resolution is speaking to the precision. The interface or the interaction is speaking to how I actually made the measurement. Does that make the uncertainty bigger? Okay, so keep that in mind. Between one and two, two is always going to make the uncertainty bigger. We're not going to get better uncertainty, okay, by evaluating number two. And we want to be very careful that we're not stating the smallest uncertainty from these three answers. We want to state the reasonable uncertainty, which oftentimes is not going to be the smallest of the three. The third one here, the repeatability, requires many samples. And it's preferred because statistically you can answer some questions. Okay, confidence factor is a natural fallout from standard deviation. Okay, standard deviation is a mathematical function that you can employ. We'll talk about that in just a second. If the resolution, let, let's do an example. So here I have a digital stopwatch, and we'll be using these quite a bit. And when I bring this into the camera, can we read that scale? Okay, what's the resolution of this measuring device? It's a stopwatch. The resolution speaks to the precision. And it also speaks to the uncertainty because it's the readability. And this is readable to one hundredth of a second. So while this is counting, I can just put stop, and it stopped at 25.66 seconds. That's a digital measurement. The resolution, we have to ask these three questions. What's the resolution of my device? Well, it's one hundredth of a second. So we'd write that down. Somewhere on some paper, we'd say, well, I have a, a stopwatch. And it has plus or minus 0 0.01 seconds. And that's the answer to question number one. And it might be the answer to the uncertainty of my measurement for time. But before I know if this is the uncertainty, I'm going to ask question number two. What is my interface or interaction with this instrument? Well, it's me. Okay, it's my, my hands, and I'm watching this event. Okay, there's this cart that's going to start here and fly by this flag. And so imagine with me this cart moving. Okay, let's just say it's moving it right across here, and I start, and then the cart moves along, and it gets over to here, and when it reaches this point, I hit stop. Huh. Do you think that there's somehow in my procedure of measurement, the interaction or the inter interface that 
causes the uncertainty to grow, to be bigger than the 0.01 seconds, one hundredth of a second. I think so. I think there's a problem with this measurement. First of all, you'll notice when I show you the scale, I've got this thing called um, reaction time. You ready? I'm going to start and stop the stopwatch. And what is the reading? Well, it's 0.14 seconds. Let's do it again. What I get this time? Oh, I didn't stop it. <laughs> got nothing. 0.13. Oh, that was really bad. 0.44. But we can see that I've got a problem with reaction time. My reaction time of 0.14 seconds is 14 times larger than the readability. So here's a situation where question number two is shedding more light on the uncertainty question. In fact, it's, it's causing the uncertainty to grow. And so I'd have to write in here um, a couple things. One, I'm going to say... The reaction time. React, yeah, that's a bad <laughs> reaction time. And I'm going to say that's plus or minus 0 0.14 seconds, which is quite a bit bigger than the 0.01 seconds. So in evaluating the uncertainty for the time measurement, I'd have to weigh these two and go with answer number two that my interface or my interaction, the procedure with which I use to measure, introduced intrinsically 0.14 seconds of uncertainty. Now, if I were to do this repeatedly, I think I would find that that's pretty consistent. And in fact, just because there's excitement and experimentation, this, might, this number could be rounded up to 0 0.2 seconds. Something I'd like to point out right now is that with uncertainties, we typically, in this physics laboratory, use one significant figure to describe our uncertainty. The one significant figure is being placed at a certain precision, at a certain decimal place. Here, it's less precision. It's at the tenths of a second. And here, it's at the hundredths of a second. It has greater precision. But in both situations, I'm only listing one significant figure. It's important to know that all the decimal and the zeros are simply the placeholders. Okay, they are not significant. Now, with this interface, question number two, we're going to have to write a new note here. We're going to have to say that, ooh, I have to multiply this by two. Because my procedure of measurement for the time for that cart to move along that track had uncertainty number one. And then as the cart went along and I have uncertainty number two at the end of that track. So I'm going to have to take this uncertainty and double it. Do you see how important it is to think through the procedure of the measurement and whether or not the procedure is affecting the uncertainty? In this timing situation, it certainly, it certainly will. And finally is repeatability or the standard deviation. Let's take the same example with our stopwatch, which has a 0 0.01 second uncertainty, one hundredth of a second plus or minus is the uncertainty of the readability. The interface with this instrument has a 0 0.4 second uncertainty. But what if I have a situation where I drop a cart along a track and drop it the same distance 30 times? And every single time I stop the stopwatch and I stop the stop, stop and stop, start and stop. And I do it again and stop and again and stop. And again, and so you get the idea. So we write down each of these measurements. And when I'm done, I've got 30 measurements for the time that it took that cart to fall along that track 30 different times. I can take those 30 different times and create a standard deviation. So this is the repeatability. 
the standard deviation is the square root of the sum of a quantity squared where the quantity is my average measurement for all 30 of those time measurements I find the average the mean value and I subtract from that average one of the individual values and so we're gonna count from um, I uh, excuse me yeah from I equals 1 to n okay where n is 30 it's the number of measurements that we took so with each measurement we take the mean and we find the difference between the mean and the individual measurement. We take that difference and we square it so it becomes a positive value. And then we take this whole thing and we divide by the number of measurements minus one. Okay, and take the square root of the whole thing. That gives us what we call the standard deviation. And the standard deviation has this symbol which is called sigma. Are we able to view this equation okay? And I'm sorry about the messiness, but this little thing right here above the sigma is an N. And for those of you who are not familiar with the sigma, it means summation. It means take this difference for the first measurement, square it, find the difference for the second measurement, square it, and add that to the first difference that's been squared. So that summation is shorthand. Okay, for 30 of these, we'd have to write this difference squared 30 times. And this is shorthand, it's convenient. Okay, and so I equals 1 to N, and here's the I, the counter. And we take the number of points that we have and subtract 1, and that is in the denominator. We find the square root of the whole summation divided by that N minus 1, and that becomes the standard deviation. That will tell us how many of the measurements... Well, excuse me, that will tell us that about 68% of all the measurements fall within that distance from the standard deviation. So let's say we measure this uh, length of time for this cart to go down this track, and after 30 measurements, we find that the average time is 2.4 seconds. The standard deviation spits out a number of, well, let's write that down, 2.4 seconds plus or minus, the standard deviation is going to answer the uncertainty. And if this formula spits out a number of 0 0.3 seconds, that becomes my uncertainty. And what that means is 68%, roughly 68%, there's my confidence factor. I'm 68% confident. 68% of all the data points, of those 30 data points, will fall right here. Here is the, our best estimate. It's the average measurement of all those 30. And if we go out one plus sigma or backwards minus sigma, that's the size of my error bars. That becomes my uncertainty. Point three. I go back to this page and I see that, ooh, here my uncertainty was equal to 0 0.4 seconds. Stopwatch resolution of 0 0.01. I have a procedural uncertainty of 0 0.4 seconds because it's a two-point measurement. But my standard deviation gave me this, plus or minus 0 0.3 seconds. Even though this number is smaller, I can use this number for the standard deviation. Three questions to ask. What's the resolution or the readability? Second question. What is my interaction or my interface? How does my procedure affect my measurement? And the third question is repeatability. When I do this measurement over and over and over, what, is this, what do the statistics tell me that my uncertainty is? I tend to favor the statistical answer when it's available.
Sometimes we cannot have repeatability. It just doesn't make sense. Um, the example of the ohm meter. Okay, you're measuring the resistance of a resistor and you put these probes across the resistor and you measure it over and over and over and over again and it's ex the exact same measurement every single time. It's kind of the nature of how these digital measurements work in that situation. So there we would have to use probably the resolution. But in this timing measurement, we found there's some interaction with the reaction time, doubled, and then we found there's repetition, and we got 0.3 seconds. So when I finally report my average time, I forget what it was now, 2.4 seconds plus or minus 0.3 seconds. And then we could go on and talk about confidence factors, but that would take a lot more discussion. We're not going to do that today. Now for some review very quickly, for a measurement we need the object to measure, we need a standard of measurement, a unit of measure, we need the procedure of measurement, okay, the interaction, the interface. That's going to help us answer something about the uncertainties possibly. And then we can talk about the confidence factor if we had more time. And I want you to remember there's three questions that you're going to ask. Please write these down, memorize them. They, they hopefully make sense. Every time you take a measurement, ask these questions. One, what is the readability or the resolution of my device? Maybe that answers the uncertainty. Second question, my interface, my interaction, my, my procedure, how did I take this measurement? Maybe that affects the uncertainty. And finally, the repeatability of the measurement. Doing the measurement over and over and over again and statistically finding the average and the standard deviation. Okay, which then lets you start to talk about confidence factors. Various types of analog and digital measurements that we'll encounter during the semester. We're going to um, be using metric scales. Um, meters or centimeters or millimeters. We'll be using those frequently throughout the semester. They're normally going to be a two-point measurement. And remember, with an analog scale, we use one-half the smallest marking. But because it's a two-point measurement, it's one-half the smallest marking plus one-half the smallest marking, which in the end, the uncertainty becomes plus or minus the smallest marking. Okay, Because we have half division, half division, they become unity, one smallest division in the end. That's an analog measurement. Digital measurements are going to vary from uh, digital multimeters, and here we have the readability. Um, it's a good practice when you use ohms, for instance, that you connect these two ends together, and you turn on the device, and you see what it reads. If it's a decent um, digital multimeter, it'll actually zero out the, the probes. Um, it's designed for that. Um, but if you're using non-standard probes, you might get a reading here of 0.3 ohms. And if all your measurements are re reading to the 0.1 ohm, you're going to have to think about an offset in your measurements. An offset is a little bit different than an uncertainty. We'll be using digital stopwatches. Okay, and here we had a readability that was one hundredth of a second. But we had an interaction that was 0.4 seconds. And then we had a um, repeatability standard deviation of 0.3 seconds for the example that I gave. And we would choose the, the standard deviation. There's other types of measurements um, that you can take. And we'll use one of these devices this semester. It's called a vernier caliper. And there's a video about how to use these. And there's an appendix in the back of your lab manual for lab one on how to read a vernier caliper and how it works. Uh, these are neat devices. Uh, they, they increase the precision of your measurement. This is an example of a vernier caliper that has a digital scale. And these are actually more common today than those analog vernier calipers. And then we have something that increases the precision even more. It's called a micrometer. Um, if we can look at this scale, can we see that scale pretty good? There's a dial scale right here. And then there's a scale that's rotated around the pole. And then there's a horizontal scale. Okay, And this is for measuring smaller things with higher precision. We should probably take a talk about those two words, um, precision versus accuracy. But first, I'm going to mention human error. 
That's the last time I want you to see those words in this laboratory, human error, okay? When we had that problem with the, the timer and it was um, one hundredth of a second readability, you might be tempted to write down in your, in your data analysis, well, it was 0 0.01 seconds uncertainty, plus or minus, but because of human error, we had 0.4 seconds uncertainty. No, no, don't use human error. Say reaction time. See, there we're being specific. If you use the human, the error, the, <laughs> the words human error, there's a couple things that will rise up in your instructor's mind and both will incite them to take the red pen and just scribble all over the page. One of those things is human error. You made a mistake. Okay, a mistake is different than an uncertainty. A mistake means you were not following procedure. Mistakes are what cause satellites to crash into planets. Okay, mistakes are what cause people when giving medicine to kill their patient because there was a human error. All right, so if, if you use the word human error in your explanation for uncertainties or error propagation, your instructor will probably just sit back, assume you made a mistake in the procedure, and just take away points like crazy. You don't want to do that. The second thing that it incites in me particularly is, is a little bit of a giggle at first because I'm thinking that you're trying to tell me that a human did this experiment. And the last time I checked, ostriches did not walk into the room and take measurements, nor did monkeys or elephants or... A hippopotamus. Okay, so <laughs> you, we're assuming that humans are doing these experiments. <laughs> All right, let, let's get that out of the way right now. <laughs> All right, and secondly, if you're making a mistake, you need to repeat the procedure and get rid of that mistake so that now we're just at the brass tacks level, we're just talking about the uncertainties. Enough said? Don't use those words, human error. Okay, be specific about how the human interacted with the equipment to introduce that error and speak to that specific um, example. Precision versus accuracy. Those two words are not interchangeable. Students often will confuse them. So we need to have a short discussion about these words. Precision, I want you to think of the word pricey. Okay, which of these two measuring devices do you think is more expensive? I think this was about 30 cents at the drugstore compared to a micrometer. Okay, the micrometer is going to have more precision. Okay, it can have more decimal places. Uh, this can actually measure smaller things than this. Accuracy is comparing your measurement to a standard. Okay, we sometimes just are loose with words and say the right answer. All right, if, if we're comparing to the acceleration due to gravity in Denver and it's been accepted and measured over and over and over again for many years and, and it's called 9.80 meters per second squared, so that that's the accepted value. And we take our measurements and we come up with 9.7. See, the accuracy is comparing our measurement to the accepted value, okay? In that case, we would call that the standard. We'd have to know the standard first. Uh, it's not acceptable to just take a measurement and say, well, there's the standard, okay? Normally, standards are, are thought through and often committees and large groups of scientists are agreeing upon that standard. So we have to be careful. So accuracy and precision are very different. One is speaking to the decimal places, the significant figures, okay? And the accuracy is speaking to, did we hit the mark? There's a graphic that is used oftentimes. This is a, a common graphic um, that is used. Th there's a target pattern here, okay? And here's a situation where we're, we're not accurate and we're not precise. We're not accurate because here's the accuracy mark. And precision has to deal with uh, how close these measurements are to one another. And so here we have not accurate and it is precise. And over here we have accurate but not precise. The reason this one's accurate is because the average of these four are closer to the mark. 
but they're not precise because they're spread out. And here we have an example where both are happening. The accuracy, because it's hitting the mark, and the precision, because they're very close together. Mm -hmm. And finally, in this little discussion, we have significant figures. When you think of significant figures, I want you to think of the word precision. Okay? I want you to think of how many decimal places I can measure. Let's, let's give some numerical examples, and then we'll talk about measurement examples. To find the significant figures in a number, we do not count the placeholders. In this number, we have three significant figures. 0, 0.00 are not significant. They simply place our measurement at the right place value. Here, 123, 0, we have three significant figures. This 0, again, is just a placeholder. Now, if we wanted to make this significant, there's two ways to do it. This one is not the best because that might be the period at the end of your sentence. Okay, but this decimal means that, oh, now my zero is significant. It's no longer just a placeholder. The other way is to write this number in scientific notation. And in scientific notation, let's see here, one, two, three, e to the positive three. The positive, by the way, is assumed. Okay, I, I put it in there sometimes just for emphasis that it's not negative. 1.230, there are four significant figures here. But if I wrote the number this way, it's the same number, but I'm saying that only three of the figures are significant. So let's do another example. Um, 1.0456. How many significant figures do we have here? One, two, three, four, five. This is five significant figures. What if I add a zero right here? That zero is significant because it's not a placeholder. It's not setting where the measurement sits on the scale. Is it in this range, this small, or is it on this range, this big? Significant figures are important when you're talking about measurements because it tells you the precision of your measurement. Some examples. If I wanted to measure the distance from here to the west coast, I am probably not going to use a micrometer. So when I write down the number and say kilometers from here to the west coast, my kilometers are not going to include millimeters. The precision is going to stop at the kilometer level. My precision is not going to go down into the meters or into the millimeter range. So if someone tells you the distance between here and the west coast is <clears throat> well, now, this is going to be rather silly because I have no idea the distance. But let's just write down a number. Um, 2346.159 kilometers. Are you going to believe their measurement? That means they can measure out to what? Here's the kilometer. And so here's the meter. And somebody else writes this number down. 2346.159264. Kilometers, there's meters, and there's millimeters. And what that means is they took a device that measures in millimeters and put it end to end all the way out to the west coast or to whatever distance they're trying to measure. That would be a high precision measurement. And you could expect that this many significant figures was very, very costly. It was not a cheap measurement. So the higher precision, 
the more money it takes, typically speaking. So these, these are not realistic measurements. The, the precision is way too high. We would expect instead to see something like this. Okay, where I had a kilometer stick, a kilometer way to measure things. And I have four significant figures. Okay, and I don't have any decimals. Scientific notation, again, is a, is a good way to, to talk about measurements because the number of sig figs is specified within the writing of the number. So here, if I were to write this out, 0, 0, 0, 4, 5, 6. Let's check this. Negative 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Some students are confused when they see this because they can't remember if these zeros are significant. They're only placeholders. The measurement occurred down here in this small range. But we're not going to take our micrometer and move it into the kilometer range because that's end over end over end and not realistic. Okay, so the precision is down here and it's three significant figures for the measurement. And so scientific notation helps us out with knowing how many significant figures there are. Students will often ask, how many significant figures do I employ in my final result? Or how many significant figures do I employ in this particular measurement? And in a physics laboratory, the answer to significant figures comes from either the uncertainty or the error propagation. And we'll move into that shortly. For the first exercise in this measurements and uncertainties lab, we're going to find out as a classroom the length of this rod. And I chose this rod for a reason, a couple reasons. And then I chose this standard, this meter um, with centimeters and marks of millimeters. I, I chose these two on purpose. Let's look at the data table. Trial one is just student one sitting at one side of the room. You will receive these and you'll make your measurement. Please don't mark on here with, with pencils. Don't put tape on here or anything. Just simply apply the rod and take your measurement. Don't neglect that step in measurement called procedure. Okay, think about how are you going to take this measurement because that might help you understand your uncertainty. After you take your measurement down, um, come up to the front computer and type it into the Excel file. And that way, the next student won't know what your value was, okay? Because we don't want to be biased in our measurements. This file, we're going to tabulate all the links measured, excuse me, by all the students in the classroom. And then there's a space for you here to calculate the average length, the difference between that and the individual length. And then you can square that difference here and down here at the bottom of the spreadsheet, there are some formulas with calculations, uh, with spaces for the calculations. So the best estimate goes right here. It's the average length. And over here, we find the variance and the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Uh, I showed this formula before with the square root symbol around it. And here we're taking the square root to find the standard deviation. And you report that standard deviation here. That's the statistical standard deviation. It means that about two-thirds of the class, set, um, their, their measurement was within that range, that standard deviation. And then some of you might want to be interested, if you take in statistics, to find the standard deviation of the mean, which is called the standard uncertainty. Okay, the standard uncertainty is slightly different. The denominator here is... Um, bigger, therefore this sigma becomes smaller. Okay, there's a technique where you can take the number of points multiplied by n minus 1. And that is known as the standard uncertainty. And here you're going to report your final results. You're going to say the average length of this rod for the whole class was this number, plus or minus, and then you'd write down your uncertainty. 
and I'll, we'll accept either the standard deviation or the standard uncertainty there. Now, there are some problems with this measurement, and I chose these two for, for reasons rather diabolical. Can we see this? Okay. So right away we see that our metric scale is um, pretty scratched up and it's not going to be easy to read everywhere along there. And the second problem we have is that this rod has thickness and we want to measure the full length of the rod from one end to the other. But there's a thread on this side and that thread has a different dimension than the rod itself and it's sitting away from the meter stick. So if you look carefully, there's distance here between the end and the meter stick. And so I guess I should turn it that way. <laughs> Do you see the problem with parallax? So are we zoomed in just on this end? Pretty good. With parallax, the problem that we have is that the object is not touching our scale. And if the two are not touching, then there's this problem with looking vertical, vertically, okay, right down there, and seeing where the end lines up. Otherwise, they're parallax. You're looking at an angle, and therefore, it's further over this way. Or if you're looking at from this angle, right here, your measurement is further over this way. So here's an example where parallax might introduce more uncertainty than when you just have the readability of the scale. Remember, for readability, we have one half the smallest marking for an analog scale. We're going to double it because on the other side, we have another uncertainty. But if parallax enters, that one half millimeter might be a joke. There might be no way that we can actually measure this to within one half millimeter because of parallax. Think of parallax lines, and we're not looking orthogonally onto the measuring device. So this is an example. When you get these two, I want you to evaluate the three questions. Am I going to do the readability of the scale? What is it? Write it down. One half millimeter. Or is there some interaction, some, some procedural interface that caused parallax, which means my uncertainty has grown? Or can I employ a statistical evaluation? In other words, take the standard deviation for the whole class and get the uncertainty that way. So that is the first exercise and it shouldn't take too long because we'll be discussing other things in the classroom as this rod and um, meter stick are passed around the room. And you take your measurement quickly and come up here and write it down on the computer. All right, for the second exercise, we're going to deal with measurement uncertainties, which will introduce procedure. Um, problems that bring in more uncertainties. And we're going to deal with um, error propagation, which we haven't talked about yet except for mentioning. How do the measurements and their uncertainties specifically, how do the uncertainties move through a formula? Okay, when we massage the measurements with an equation, what happens to the uncertainties? All right, that, that's error propagation. So here's the exercise. We want to find the area of these tables. Okay, so this table right here, we want to find its area with two measurements. We'll call this the, the width, and we'll call this long part the length. Okay, so we want to measure width and length. And by area of the table, what I mean is if we take some light, so a bird's eye view, take some light and shine it straight down so there's no parallax on the, this table, we will see a shadow on the floor. Okay, and it's that shadow that we want to measure. Okay, so I'm talking about the outside edge because there's this problem of this bevel. But I just got rid of that problem by saying there's light shining right down past this bevel and it shines on the floor. And so the area of the, of the table is from side to side. Okay, and this side to the far side. We're not going to include the cabinets at the end of the table. We'll just do the table itself. Now there's some constraints. One is I want you to use this almost meter stick. We could call this um, a wannabe. Oh, can you see me okay? That's such a wide angle. A wannabe meter stick. I don't want you to use a two meter stick. You'll be tempted. 
um, I want you to stick with the same standard. So don't, don't change sticks mid-measurement. Go ahead and over here, please. So a couple problems I want to introduce you to with this wannabe meter stick. Can you see the end okay over here? There's problems here. Okay, some person cut off the end at a goofy angle, so we can't use the zero point. It's, it does not exist. That's the first problem. That's going to enter into your procedural steps. The second problem that we have, and I don't know how well we can do with the camera pointing down, but we want to look at this measurement. Up here is problematic because the end of my table is over here and there's a distance here because of the bevel. And so there's parallax, a great deal of parallax. And my uncertainty here of the one half the smallest marking, one half millimeter, gets blown away immediately because of parallax. And we might have three or four millimeters uncertainty on each side of this table with this parallax. So do you remember earlier when we talked about parallax? How can we reduce parallax? We can reduce parallax by getting the scale closer to the table. And the thickness of this meter stick causes that problem. So some students put it right here. And now they can see the end of the table and line it up, but they still have the thickness. So they've gotten rid of the, the thickness of the bevel by putting it on the side here. But they still have the thickness of the stick. The stick is still causing problems. So there's two ways that I've seen students overcome this. What do you think they are? One of them is taking the stick and touching the scale to the table. See, now I can start to see that the parallax is almost gone. And when I take this measurement, I can have an uncertainty of one half millimeter on this side. So that's pretty good. But actually, it turns out there's still a little parallax, so I'm probably going to have to increase that and call it one millimeter uncertainty for each side, which means one millimeter uncertainty plus the other side, another millimeter is two millimeters uncertainty for the width. And another thing I've seen students do, again, we're using the metric side. Do not use the inches side. They take the metric side and plaster it against the table, and then they come over here and take the reading looking from this side. So we take the measurement here, whichever method you choose, and then we go to the other side of the table and take the measurement over there. Now we have a problem with the length. And this is one of the reasons that I'm constraining you to use the meter stick and not the two meter stick. And the problem happens right here. I've got one millimeter uncertainty down there due to um, parallax a little bit. And then down here, my meter stick ends. I need to measure the length all the way down to the end of the table. We have a rule in this laboratory to not write on the equipment. And that includes the table. Do not get out your pocket knife and carve into the table. We will confiscate the knife and um, kick you out of school. No, I'm kidding. Just don't write on the equipment. Don't mark it up. That's going to cause problems. The most we'll let you do in this situation is, is employ some sticky notes. Okay, so hopefully there's some sticky notes in the room, and you can just employ a sticky note right here to mark so that you can then move your stick. But now, how much uncertainty do you have in the length measurement? You see you have uncertainty down here of one millimeter, parallax, and then you have uncertainty twice right here because you have the end of the stick, and then you've moved the stick and you've tried to line it up so you've doubled your uncertainty. And then we get down here, two more, and then one at the end. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six points of uncertainty. So let's take a look at what we're going to record here. The length measurement tool is a wannabe meter stick. Okay, or you could call this a, a less than meter stick, <laughs> all right? So write down the, what the measurement tool is. This worksheet will show you what you should be doing during every experiment for every type of measurement that you take. 
resolution of said device. 0 0.001 meters. That's the resolution of the device. But I'm going to put a note here, and I'm going to say that's for a two-point measurement. So you might want to say plus or minus 0 0.5 millimeters. Because remember, we can do half the smallest scale. That's the readability. Resolution might be used to find the uncertainty of the measurement. Procedure for measuring the width. Well, I'm going to place scale touching the table. That's very important. Okay, we found that out because that reduced the parallax. And then I'm going to say um, it's a two-point measurement. And because of, well, I'm running out of room now. Because, of, hopefully you'll write smaller, because of parallax, because of parallax, I have a um, plus or minus 0 0.002 meter uncertainty for the width. Okay. And so down here you have four people at your table, let's say. You're going to record the width, whatever it was. And then you're going to write down their uncertainty. Maybe someone else estimates their uncertainty to be larger because the parallax. It's up to each lab partner. And then you're going to average your widths and get report an average width right there. Average width right there. And you're going to average your uncertainties and report that at the bottom. For the length, we have a one, two, three, what do we say? A six point measurement. A six point measurement. Whoa. And we had uncertainties at least one millimeter at each point because of parallax. And maybe we even introduced some more because of that sticky note and sliding the stick that we didn't do a great job in aligning it. So I have at least six millimeters of uncertainty, but maybe I'll have to increase that a little bit and call it. Um, when there was two interactions there, so maybe we'll call that eight millimeter uncertainty, plus or minus, which is equal to plus or minus 0 0.008 meters. Okay. And so that uncertainty would go right here, but maybe your lab partner does a better job with the six point measurement, and so they might have a little bit less uncertainty or greater uncertainty. And so you just record all these values and then find the average of each, both the length measurement and the uncertainty. Now, I think I forgot to mention two things. <laughs> one of, well, the two things that we're measuring, one of them is area and the other one is perimeter. Okay, and I, I used the wrong word there. I don't know if you caught that. We're not measuring these, we're calculating the area and we're calculating the perimeter. Okay, to find those calculations of area and perimeter, we measured the two sides of a table, being the width and the length. And then I want you to simply find the perimeter and the area. Um, for the perimeter, of course, we're going to double the width and add to that double the length. Okay, And then for the area, of course, we're just going to take the width and multiply it by the length. And you'll find out these values and then report your averages down there. All right, when it comes to um, dealing with error propagations, we're going to need a quantity that's called a relative uncertainty. We'll define the relative uncertainty now, and then we'll, we'll use it in just a minute. To find a relative uncertainty, we're relating the uncertainty to the measurement as a ratio. And I like to say it that way because it helps me remember how to set up the ratio. A relative uncertainty relates the uncertainty to the measurement. 
So that ratio is take the uncertainty and divide by the measurement. Multiply by 100%, and now we have a percent uncertainty, a relative uncertainty as a percentage. And the symbol we're going to use for uncertainty is this. That's a Greek delta, lowercase delta, as compared to this, which is an uppercase delta. And delta often means difference. And I'm going to use a lowercase delta to signify a small difference because uncertainties are often very small. So a relative uncertainty is the uncertainty in the measurement divided by the measurement itself multiplied by 100%. What are the units of this relative uncertainty? If the uncertainty in the measurement has the same units as my measurement itself, then the units are, are canceled. Okay, this is a dimensionless number when we're finished. So the relative uncertainty in length and width this is a this is kind of a mistake down here on your worksheet. You're supposed to have two spaces to write things. This is just for you to write the results. And you can calculate them up here. The measurement uncertainty is written right here as the average. So the average uncertainty is the measurement uncertainty. And you know it's a measurement uncertainty because it has units. And there's spaces right here allowing you to put in the units for each of these. Okay, and be careful with perimeter and area. So to find the uncertainty in width, we take the uncertainty of the width and we divide by the width. And by width, I mean the average. So this would be the average width. We could put a little bar over that. And by this, I mean the average uncertainty in width. And then multiply by 100%, which gives us a dimensionless number relating the uncertainty to the measurement. And do the same thing for the length. So the uncertainty delta L divided by the length measurement itself and multiply by 100%. Here we just have a little table to repeat these, the length, the average length, and the width, and then the relative uncertainties, just so you have them available on this next worksheet. And then we want you to write these out fully. And by fully, I mean write down the length measurement and say plus or minus your uncertainty, okay, as a relative uncertainty. So we have a big question. How do the uncertainties propagate through the calculation? We need to reason about this for a minute. It's pretty easy in the case of the width. Because we had this wannabe meter stick and it was a two-point measurement, we didn't have to move anything. We took the measurement and then we took the measurements along the length. It was a little harder and then we find perimeter. How do we find the error, insert error propagation for perimeter? The error propagation for a sum, because that's really all we're doing, we're taking the width plus the length plus the width again plus the length again. The rule for error propagation, and I hope this goes to reason, you simply add the uncertainties. And since the uncertainties are being added, they all have the same units, we can either add the uncertainties themselves or we can add up the relative uncertainties. Either way. But in the case of area, we have a problem. Let's say we have an uncertainty in length of two mil uh, in width of two millimeters. And let's say we have an uncertainty in length of eight millimeters. What happens when we multiply those numbers. Because we multiplied the measurements to find the area, 0 0.002 multiplied by 0 0.008, that may be your first guess. 
But what happens to these decimal numbers when you multiply them? Do the uncertainties through error propagation, do they get smaller through this calculation? Or do they do get, or do they get larger? We would expect from our perimeter measurement that the uncertainties grow through the error propagation. As the measurements propagate through a formula, the uncertainties will propagate and get bigger. But in this case of area, if we take the two values, length and width, and multiply them together, their uncertainties, this number gets smaller. So this is not the solution. So to review, the perimeter is the sum of measurements, but what about the uncertainties? Here, we can simply take two, here, let me use a red pen, two times the uncertainty in length divided by length plus two times the uncertainty in width divided by the width equals the uncertainty, oops, that's not a delta, equals the uncertainty in the perimeter divided by the perimeter. So when you're done, when you're done with the summation of the uncertainties, be careful, you have a relative uncertainty in perimeter. Let me say that again. When you sum the relative uncertainties for the pieces of the perimeter, you end up with a relative uncertainty for the perimeter. Now, somebody could also, because this is um, to find the perimeter, we just added them. You could take the uncertainty in the length plus twice the uncertainty in the width. I forgot to double this length. And that would be equal to the uncertainty in the perimeter. That's not a relative uncertainty. That's a measurement uncertainty. And the only reason we can do that is because these dimensions, we can add them and the uncertainty grows. We do not want our uncertainties to shrink as they propagate through a formula. Doesn't make sense. Well, we could just get more measurements and just multiply them all together and all our uncertainties would decrease with each multiplication. Okay, that this just does not stand a reason. The uncertainties have to get larger. The area uncertainty works like this. We take the uncertainty in the length divided by the length and we add to that the uncertainty in the width divided by the width. That's the rule for multiplication. That will equal the uncertainty in the area divided by the area. When we look at this formula, we see the rule for finding error propagation through a product. If you use this rule for even summation, you'll be safe. The rule says that when we have a product of measurements, we take a measurement, take a measurement, and we multiply them together. The uncertainties grow. They propagate through that multiplication by adding their relative uncertainties. Dimensionless number plus a dimensionless number yields a dimensionless number. On the right-hand side of this equation, we have the relative uncertainty in the area. So I want you to calculate those down here and write out the perimeter and area with the relative uncertainties that you find. Now, if we had five variables and multiplied them all together, we would find the uncertainty in the final answer as a relative uncertainty and we simply add all those relative uncertainties together. And when we're done, we have a relative uncertainty in the final answer. When students ask, what 
Or how many significant figures do I need to write down for this measurement or for this final result? The proper answer is find out from your uncertainties. The uncertainties will tell you to what decimal place you can record. All right. Let's take this example where we have the area of the table. I just made up a number, okay? This is not realistic, but it's, it's an example. So it's this number, 2563.272 meters squared for the area. So a question comes up, well, how many significant digits do I write down for this area? It's a very good question. The answer comes from, again, hopefully you know this by now, from the uncertainties. And in this case of area, we have error propagation through relative uncertainty summation. So we find the relative uncertainties for the area, and we sum them up. Well, let's say that somebody did that summation, and they got this for the relative uncertainty in the area. 4%. Does that answer the question yet? How many significant figures can I write down for this area calculation? I know that my uncertainty is 4% of this, so I need to do a calculation. So I already did that. Oops. Somewhere in here, if I touch in the magic spot, and sorry I drew. There we go. So I took this number, 2563.272, and multiplied it by 4%. I get this number, 102.5. But if you remember, we said that in this laboratory, our uncertainties are going to be reported as one significant figure. It tells us at what decimal place we can measure, and it tells us at that decimal place, how do we count? And this is telling me, this translates into 100 meter squared uncertainty. So up here, we can say translates into 100 meter squared uncertainty. So we can do a plus or minus right here and plus or minus right there. Which means we need to report our area as this. The area is equal to 2500 zero, zero meter squared plus or minus 100 meters squared. That is our full statement. We've been very careful that our uncertainty, the one significant figure in the uncertainty, is matching the last significant figure that we mentioned in our measurement. Oops, did you see the mistake that I did? I hope you saw it because this was not done properly. This six right here means that the five has to round up. Sorry about that. Good object lesson. So this becomes six. 2,600 meters squared plus or minus 100 meters squared. So we just answered the question. To how many sig figs do we write our area as a number? And the answer to that is two significant figures. Because the most we c the best we can do in the calculation for area is in the 100 meter squared range. And finally, the whole class, we could do a standard deviation based on all the perimeter measurements and all the area measurements for the class if there's time. So if there's time, it's a good idea to tabulate all these, and every student can write down all the perimeter and areas. I've done this before in the classroom by just saying, okay, table number um, 31, tell us your perimeter and area. And they, they speak those out, and everybody writes them down. And so it only takes about a minute to go around the whole room, and everybody can have this data, and you can find the standard deviation to practice that formula. If you look on your calculator, you'll find that there's statistics and there's standard deviation. You'll probably have to read your manual to figure out how that works. Um, and Microsoft Excel has a standard deviation function. You type in all the data, and then a formula below there or somewhere else, you write equals S-T-D-E-V. Let me write that down for you. In Microsoft Excel, S-T-D-E-V, and then you um, point to the range of where all the measurements sits. 
and that will spit out the standard deviation like that. It's a lot simpler than find the average and the differences, square them and add them all up and divide by n minus one, square root for the whole thing, and, or you just type that in and it's finished. So I'd like to remind you that with every measurement you take, there's three questions you're gonna ask to get to the uncertainty answer. What is the uncertainty of my measurement? Well, it either comes from resolution, interface, or repeatability. Those are the things that you want to ask. Resolution, readability, interface or interaction or procedure or how, and then repeatability, the standard deviation, over and over and over again, what do I find that I have 68% of all my measurements sitting within that range? When you take a measurement, I want you to take care to understand your measurement. What is the standard? What is the unit? What is the uncertainty? How did you find the uncertainty? Was it the readability? Was it from something else like parallax or some other procedural step that brought in more uncertainty? Or did the uncertainty come from a standard deviation? Every experiment that has data and analysis, you will have a post lab that asks a simple question. It says, describe every measurement type. So if you take a length measurement 20 times, don't describe 20 measurements, but just say we measured length. And then state a sample value. So maybe the average of all those results. Or maybe you can say a range, this length to this length, it doesn't matter. And then state the uncertainty. And here it's your choice if you use uh, measurement uncertainty or relative uncertainty. Remembering that relative uncertainty is taking the uncertainty and dividing it by the measurement. And then after you've stated all that, in parentheses, as a parenthetical, you need to explain very concisely how you got the uncertainty. Oh, well, this was simply the readability of my ohm meter or the readability of my digital device, or the readability of my meter stick. Or you're going to say, this came from parallax, and it was a three-point measurement. Or you're going to say in parentheses, uh, 30 measurements were made, and the standard deviation was found. Okay, so it's a concise statement explaining how you arrived at your uncertainty. Because we want to know that you've asked these three questions, and you've come up with a reasonable, believable answer. Please don't think after today's lecture and after the exercise that you go through in the laboratory, please don't think that measurements are cheap. Okay, measurements are costly, both with time, with money, and also with thought. Okay, it's a process to get a good measurement. And then don't forget that errors propagate through calculations. And they propagate through a multiplication by simply summing the relative uncertainties. You find the relative uncertainty and you add them up. And when you're all done, don't forget that a percent uncertainty is the relative uncertainty. To find the measurement uncertainty, you're simply going to have to multiply your percentage by your ratio. Okay, And that will leave you with the measurement uncertainty, which we found in this example to be 100 meters squared. It's a lot of information. We'll be using it all semester long. There'll be different reviews during different experiments of all these topics. And other thing will be pointed out, a very important one is the computer will show you 10 digits for measurement, but maybe only three of them are significant. And so you need to understand, even when you're measuring with a computer, what is it measuring? What is the unit? What is its uncertainty? So please pause at the beginning of every experiment and record these things in your notebook. Hope you got something from this lecture. And we'll see you in lab. Um, I want to leave you with a few thoughts. One of them is about measurements and uncertainties. It is really important for most of the disciplines that come through these physics labs to consider these things well and to learn from them. If you're a nurse or a doctor and there's a bad measurement, people can die or there can be problems, complications in their life for the rest of their lives. I've seen that many times in hospital situations. 
So please consider every measurement as important and understanding the uncertainties. And you might want to investigate about the confidence factor depending on the, the situation. If, if you're an engineer and you're going to be building bridges, I just drove across the new um, on-ramp. It was, oh, where was it? I think it was Arapahoe Road to Parker Road, getting onto Parker Road from Arapahoe Road, and I was going maybe northbound on Parker Road, and there's this ramp that goes around in a circle. Well, those engineers who built that didn't understand their physics. Okay, and their measurements were off. And if you take that on-ramp, you might want to be careful on a snowy, icy day because that ramp is perfectly flat. And if they would have been doing their measurements right, they would have given it an angle. You'll learn about that in Physics 1. Uh, planes have fallen out of the sky because of poor measurements. There's one famous example of a, a satellite that was sent to Mars, I believe. And Lockheed Martin was working on it and... Um, NASA, I forget who the two entities were who were communicating, but on one side there was one individual and he was dealing in the unit of feet, feet per second. And the other group of people were dealing with meters per second, different units. And they were reporting their numbers without units to one another in a, in a timely basis so that they could orchestrate this orbit around Mars. But the orbiter crashed into Mars unexpectedly and it was later investigated and found out that the two entities were using different measurements. Oops, one last topic. It was forgotten, neglected, and oh, so sadly missed. So, how different are they? Or what is their discrepancy? When we have two different representations of a particular value, we need some way to compare the two values we can use either percent difference or percent discrepancy. For example, we have measured the mass of an object with the digital balance and with an analytical balance. Neither measurement is necessarily more accurate than the other one. In this case, we use percent difference. The percent difference is defined as the absolute value of the quantity measurement 1 minus measurement 2. Then we divide that difference by the average of measurement 1 and measurement 2 and multiply, of course, by 100%. In another example, we have measured g, the acceleration due to gravity. But g has a value that is well accepted by scientists around the world. Let's even say NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, has even measured G at your experiment location. By the way, there are companies that will bring a device to your laboratory and measure the value of G to N decimal places, where N is simply defined by your pocketbook. You measure G to be 9.67 meters per second squared, but the accepted G is 9.80 meters per second squared. And by the way, 9.80 is the accepted G in Denver, Colorado. At sea level, it is 9.81 meters per second squared. We also call this the expected G. In this case, we use percent discrepancy, where the percent discrepancy is defined as the absolute value of the measurement minus the expected Take that difference and divide by the expected. Multiply, of course, by 100%. In that example, with the numbers 9.67 and 9.80, both in meters per second squared, we take their difference and divide by 9.80, multiply by 100%, and we get 1.3% discrepancy. Notice that both percent difference, which has no expected value, and percent discrepancy, which has an expected value, will be positive, not negative, because we use the absolute value of the difference. Finally, note the term relative difference is the same as percent discrepancy. And finally, I want to leave you with this little quip. Um, it was a true story. It was a number of years ago. I subscribed. I had this new little cell phone and it could do text messages was all it could do. It was really cool. And I subscribed to this thing of goofy news and came across the wire in the morning. I was on the bus coming to work here and 
read this story. And it's pretty amazing. It illustrates the example of accuracy versus precision. So in a foreign country, foreign to the United States, and they were testing um, a rocket, um, some sort of missile rocket. And the scientists were all prepared, and they're standing there at the test site, and this rocket goes up, and they're all excited, and then it turns too soon. They all got worried on their faces, and this thing cruised across the country, and bam, it hit a barn. This, this very poor farmer had one barn, and this rocket hit the barn and just demolished it. And they got in their expensive government cars and drove out there, found the rocket and found the farmer just crushed, looking at the debris. And they were trying to console him, saying that we are so sorry, we will pay for your barn. And the guy was saying, but it's going to cost so much. I mean, the guy was poor. This was, this was his life savings. And he couldn't understand. And they, they just, they tried to impress upon him that they had the money to replace his barn. So this is what they said. They said, you need to understand that this rocket we made with the engineers and the machine shop, everything was measured to within incredible number of significant figures. It was a precision instrument. The cost for this precision instrument was huge compared to this barn. We can afford to replace your barn. So please understand that with precision instruments comes a lot of money. And the farmer looked at these scientists and he said, yes, but your rocket was not very accurate. <laughs> 